Oh yeah. System. It would. That's all right. We'll just we'll just mime it. Yes, it would be very ironic, wouldn't it? <laughs> Yeah, so my name is Lauren Keeney. I'm a research scientist in the Freshwater Ecology and Conservation Lab at, uh, at UW. And I am I'm really excited to, talk, to be here today to talk about some of the ways that um, both I and other researchers are applying a passive acoustic monitoring to forest ecosystem for ecology and uh, monitoring. And if you're interested, oops, sorry, this, let me, I can just use this to figure out, where's my button? Got it. That's my acoustic signature. You're welcome to create one if you want to catch this. Maybe it's catch on, you know, over time. Different way of presenting your name. <laughs> it's pretty, you know. Um, so I'm going to talk through a couple different aspects of passive acoustic monitoring today. And so I just wanted to go through what they are. The first one, why should you care about this technique and application and what is it? And then I'll just sort of walk through what I think are some really interesting new, really new ways that researchers um, uh, and managers are applying this in forest ecosystems. I'm then going to switch gears and talk about a study that I've been doing um, e over the last year, which is related actually to the growler jets that are, the Navy has been flying out in the Olympic Peninsula. And then I'll just have wrap up with some conclusions. Um, what is passive acoustic monitoring and why should you care about it? So passive acoustic monitoring, it simply means that there's a listening device, a microphone, either a hydrophone under the water or a terrestrial microphone. And the passive part means that unlike active acoustic monitoring, which would send a signal and then return it, passive is simply listening. These are some different arrays. This is one that the National Park Service uses. It's pretty comp complex. It's got an anemometer and a sound pressure level meter. And then there's less complicated units that we use. This is the kind that we use a song meter for. Um, relatively inexpensive. You can deploy it on a lake if you want. <laughs> and then all the way to hydrophones, which run the range, you can get in expensive ones, then there's also more expensive ones. So, so all of these are basically listening to vibrations that various animals or processes are, are putting into the environment. Um, the other part of passive acoustic monitoring, it sort of describes what I'm doing out there. Um, I'm not working very hard. Um, so <laughs> and, uh, I'm joking, these are all me in, out in the field. Here's me deploying that on a lake and on a tree. Um, I am being a little bit jokey about this, but one of the attractive things about this is for um, a field crew of one person, you can go out and collect literally thousands of hours of data um, for not a, not a huge amount of resources. So it's really worth keeping in mind um, that even on a small scale, sometimes you can accomplish a lot of data collection um, for, for modest resources. Um, yeah, and I'm just going to talk about, you know, what, what is it about sound that is it that we analyze and what's useful about it and listening to things and in the environment. So, you know, sound is a wave. Great. Waves have properties. Um, they occur over time. Um, they have periods. And so period has to do with basically the, the narrowness of the distance between your vibrations. And so when you have a short period, this is going to give you a high pitch. Um, if you have dogs, you may play around with your pitch sometimes when you're giving them commands or something like in, ter in terms of highness or lowness of sounds. Uh, low frequency sounds tend to be things like uh, human transportation, jets, airplanes, roads, that kind of thing. High frequency sounds are going to be birds, uh, amphibians, insects, bats, that kind of thing. And then also another property of sound that we're interested in is the power, the amplitude, the loudness. Um, also, if you have dogs, you probably play around with your pitch and your amplitude sometimes when you're doing this. So over here, we have a low frequency wave with some amplitude, and this is an example of a higher frequency. Uh, so maybe this is a jet, and maybe this is a bird, something like that. And these are properties of sound that we then analyze and, and are using in, in analyzing PAM, or passive acoustic monitoring data. Um, so this, we're going to look at this, this representation, representation of sound. I'm going to keep, you'll see this a lot through this talk, so I'll just break it down a little bit. This is one of the ways that sound is represented most frequently called a spectrogram. And so here we have some time period. This is about an hour of data that I collected on the Olympic Peninsula last year. And then we have frequency moving up. So here's our low frequencies down here, human powered, human generated noise, amphibians, birds, insects are all up here. Um, and then uh, the amplitude is represented in the color scheme. So uh, blues are low amplitude, low power, low free, and then the uh, white moving up to white is a high power. So we have a species out here on the Olympic Peninsula, a new species called a growler jet. 2016, the Navy started using this jet. Um, and in this 
example, you can see the acoustic signature of this species, if you will. Really evident, lots of power in the, lots of amplitude in the low frequencies down there, really obvious and easy to pick up. So this data can be used to kind of assess changes on the landscape in large scales, right, over large time periods and large things. However, one of the really neat things is this really high resolution data. So if you hone in, you can pick up individual bird calls. So if you're interested in tracking or detecting things on like a species level or behavioral levels, uh, this data kind of allows you to do all of that. So it's one of these, going back to that idea of kind of for low resources, you can collect a lot of information. This is high resolution data, can be analyzed at various scales. And again, it can be relatively inexpensive to collect. Um, so hopefully I talk, convinced you why you should care about this technology. Um, I'm going to be talking the next, I'm going to go through three examples of really recent research that people have been using acoustic monitoring in forest ecosystems for various purposes. And I've tried to focus on really recent stuff to demonstrate sort of where the technology is going and being used. Um, so I think you know, one of the most uh, apparent ways that you're using, can use passive acoustic monitoring is for detecting species and or sensing species. And this is a group out of Oregon State. Um, and they used passive acoustic monitoring to, uh, in a mixed burn, uh, mixed severity burn area to assess relative use by six different owl species. I'm only showing here uh, two, but they actually monitored six species. Here's our spectrogram right there for different owl calls. Um, just as an example, so in between March and July of 2017, they collected 37,000 hours of data. Um, it's a lot of information. And then you usually, most people are, they're using computer programs or algorithms to detect, to scan through all of that data, basically counting and then evaluating where in their burn area they were detecting these species. So a couple things that are interesting about this, um, it can be, really useful way to detect species that are difficult, like northern spotted owls and or rare on your landscape, and endangered where you have issues maybe with um, the other types of surveys. So it can be a non-invasive detection technique, and I thought this was a really interesting recent study. Um, so this is another uh, interesting thing that was just published uh, just this year, actually, at a group out of the uh, UK in uh, Thetford, Thetford Forest, I believe. So it turns out, not terribly surprisingly, but the acoustic environment is a pretty good proxy of the general biodiversity of um, different ecosystems or, or managed forest stands types. And so what this group did is uh, Thetford Forest is uh, a coniferous plantation. It's a managed forest with stands ranging from zero all the way up to 85 years old. And they deployed a grid of monitoring units across this and then mapped the acoustic diversity that they were recognizing in terms of species that they're listening and hearing, and then mapped that across the age of the stand as well as the structural complexity of the stand. And they found that it was a pretty good, um, again, not a not uh, very labor intensive way of getting a snapshot of what is the biodiversity and how is that varying across there. So I think this, so this here is the acoustic diversity index and this is the age of the forest stand. And so I think that this way it's, it's got a, a lot of potential for taking sort of a, a snapshot, if you will, of ecosystem health or recovery, uh, rates of recovery over time, that kind of thing in terms of applying that to forest monitoring. And then lastly, I love this study. Um, so they were monitoring species, they were actually monitoring bees. Um, this was done in 2017, they just published this. That's a bee, uh, that's the vibration of its wings picked up on an acoustic monitor. Believe it or not, this monitoring unit costs about $150. Um, not a lot of money. Um, and they, they deployed it in a, uh, an array of them in farmers' fields, and the idea was to actually try and create this as a way that uh, either non-specialists or uh, citizen scientists or, uh, and or farmers could actually monitor their own pollination activities. So what they did, they created a, a software program, an algorithm basically, that can detect this spectrogram pattern, which is a, a bee, and then they compared that to more traditional sort of visual surveys and, and bee counts and came up with really good relationships. Um, I've never done bee counts, but I would think they're pretty difficult. Um, so I'm, I would think that this might be an attractive alternative to doing that. I thought this was fun. They said eavesdropping on bee flight buzzes was a good 
landscape uh, way to assess uh, landscape scale pollination activity. So I thought this was a really interesting and unique way to do this. And I loved that they were trying to make it, and that's a lot, the direction of this uh, technology is moving toward more accessible uh, ways of using it for inex using inexpensive technologies. Um, so now I'm just gonna switch gears a little bit and um, talk about how I've been applying acoustic monitoring to growler jets in the Olympic Peninsula. Um, depending on how, how near you live here, you're more or less familiar with this issue. Um, but basically the, the idea of this study is that in about 2016, the US Navy completed a switch from the previous aircraft that they were using, a prowler, to the growler jet, which is substantially louder. Um, they are also undergoing, they're in the middle of an uh, environmental impact statement process whereby they're proposing to increase flights traffic by about 30%. Um, and this is estimated to be about 250 days, up to, to about 250 days a year. Um, there are concerns out in the Olympic Peninsula about uh, the impacts, obviously, on people. Um, both the residents that live here, tourism, and then also the impacts on, of, on wildlife um, are really largely kind of not studied. Um, and especially, potentially, we have species of concern out here, northern spotted owl, marbled murrelet, and given that the, the impacts are really not very well understood, we set out to just try and do a, a well, so I should caveat this. This is a small-scale study. It has a field technician of one, that's me. It has a data ana analyst of one, project manager, so I just want to caveat that this is where, where, where it's kind of more, not a pilot exactly, I'm not going to call it a pilot, but it is a small scale study. Um, but anyway, over the last year, we have five sites. We, me, I have five sites. I've been rec recording acoustic data between two and four times a year at each of these sites in 2017 and then in some this year as well. There's two sites with red stars. So those two sites were monitored actually by the National Park Service in 2010 and 2011 using very similar uh, comparable methods. So we actually can sort of start building this baseline or this uh, time trend, if you will, and sort of before and after growler uh, impacts. All of these locations are uh, very in stages of forest forestedness, but they, they haven't been recently logged and they're all far enough away from a road that we don't have confounding effects of, of any real human uh, noises or, or transportate other times, types of transportation noise that we have to deal with. So here's our handy, handy spectrogram again. The methods are actually, I mean, one of the things I like about this, this uh, technology is it's really easy to understand. Here's our hour of data collected out on the peninsula, those really obvious signals. There's nothing out here that looks you know, like air traffic really. Other than that, you can, they're pretty easy to identify. And what we're doing is uh, we, again, me, <laughs> I'm gonna quit saying we. I'm going through and uh, classifying each of these events. Now there are other air traffic, so I'm classifying them as growler, commercial jets, and then there's also prop planes. And what I'm building is a database of each of these events, and each of them have a duration, they have amplitude, they have the frequency ranges that are being uh, impacted, uh, time of day, you know, all that kind of stuff. So we're building, I'm building this database of events. Um, and then I'm, gonna, I'm starting to use that. So this is you know, preliminary stuff. This is about 10 days worth of data from one site from last year. Um, and I'm, use, building, I'm using the database that I'm creating to start to play around with things like how many of these flight events do we have uh, in a given time period? And what are, they, what are they looking like? So on this axis down here, I have growler jets, commercial aircraft, and prop planes. We can see that even over that 10 day period, the growlers are uh, outnumbering the other types of events. Most of these I'm classifying into sort of low, medium, and high impact, just to take a, but I also have the more detailed amplitude data. But most of these, you know, you would, an ordinary listener would classify these as a low impact um, event, um, but there are some of these high and medium impact events, and those we're interested in too. And the other thing that I can start to do with now is start to look at, um, so on this axis down here, I have the frequencies, the low frequency ranges all the way up to the high frequency, and then the average um, loudness. Uh, for this graph, I focused only on the low impact events because I had more of those events to look at. But we can start to actually say, okay, well, what, how are these signals different from each other, and what are the, the decibels and the loudness that we're interested in, or sorry, what are the decibels and loudness that we're um, 
kind of distinguishing these different events from one another, and then I can start to relate that to species of concern um, in terms of actual levels, frequency, magnitude, and that kind of thing. So again, this is, I've got about 60% of the data collected, so the next steps on this project are to finish out our year of data collection, um, and then I need to contrast that with the 2010-2011 data from the National Park Service, and then I want to start relating that to vulnerability of different species out on the coast and ones that we might actually be um, you know, having issues with or concerns about both. And I want to mention, so the idea of doing that is both currently, what are the, you know, the issues under the current levels, but also under those proposed future scenarios of that 30% traffic increase. So just, um, this, is, this is actually my conclusion slide. I want to go back to the idea of just passive acoustic monitoring in general um, and how it's not a silver bullet. It is a useful uh, technology in, some, in many circumstances, in the right circumstances. So benefits, you get lots of data. Challenge, you get a lot of data. Um, <laughs> like, you gotta have a data management and processing plan, like seriously. Um, so uh, the other thing I think is really interesting, this is really this technology and the software and the hardware that's being developed is emerging and it's rapidly changing and the drive is trying is just making it more accessible and more easily manipulated and more easily collected, um, especially in areas where there aren't as th we don't have the conservation resources that we have here. So developing countries are trying to use this to mobilize citizen science networks of people for monitoring. Um, so that is great. Um, I think the flip side of that is that you really have to think long and hard whether the existing monitoring and regulatory frameworks can accept this kind of evidence. So if you go out and you, you know, detect some endangered species using this, this method, is that an accepted method that, of detection? Um, and so really I think it's such, in some ways, a, such a rapidly changing technology that you really want to think that through. Um, it's non-invasive. You don't have, so if you have sensitive or endangered species, it can be really useful for that. However, those, either the species that you're interested in or the process, the ecosystem process, has to have some sort of acoustic signal. Um, and I, I say species, but there are actually ecological processes that, that do make sound. So for example, people are using it now in oceans to monitor uh, health of coral reefs, which, which have gas exchange sounds. Um, it can be relatively inexpensive. Um, however, the data processing is not, it's, there's a learning curve associated with that. It's, it's not beyond the realm of being technically possible, but there is, it's a little different than just collecting something and doing a t-test. I think one of the major benefits, it's got great citizen science potential, both in terms of collecting the data and analyzing and monitoring and processing that data. So I think that's really exciting. And with that, so many people and organizations have been supportive. They've provided some funding or data, uh, uh, land access, or just been generally wonderful. And um, I just want to acknowledge the, the various groups that have been participating in helping this project.